Okay, so um, today's lecture will be divided into two uh, completely disjoint parts. The first part, the first lecture will be uh, with slides, and it will be an attempt to explain the one RSB. situation in constraint satisfaction problems, and I will really uh, try to outline recent works of uh, Ding, uh, Fly, and Sun, which deal with the prediction for uh, satisfaction, satisfaction threshold in case uh, an independent set. These are results that appeared in uh, the end under mathematical results in uh, lecture one, and this will be done with slides. And the second part, I will talk about coexistence for easing uh, on like graphs, and this will be what I will explain mostly is the paper from 2011 by Montanari and Sly, which do the regular case. Result, more general result by uh, Nirban Basak and myself for later, maybe three years later. And this will be done by on the blackboard. Board, and this will be right. Okay, now um, some uh, word of caution. The first part, this work on the slides, will be this, unlike everything else, it's not stuff that I uh, have uh, contributed to. And moreover, I tried to prepare my own slides for it, and I got into trouble. And so I borrowed slides of uh, Nike Sun and uh, modified them, and I plan to modify them further uh, before posting them. So there will be a better version of the slides that I will use uh, for posting. But just for this talk, I will use the slides I have. Okay, so first part will be a review of a constraint satisfaction problem. This is the same topic that we mentioned already in the first lecture. And then there will be a review of the statistical physics prediction for constraint satisfaction problem. And what will be new for this talk, what we focus is on the, the ref, re, what is the meaning of replica symmetric breaking and what is the meaning of one RSV. But this will be done in the context of constraint satisfaction problem. That is in the context of zero temperature. So the emphasis, this will be a special case of the more general picture because what we talked about in lecture three when I talked about the limit for easing and also in lecture uh, was really done in positive temperature with the exponential measure which has an exponential weight. Here, the measure will just be about constraint. It's a problem of constraints. So it will be slightly different and it's slightly easier, which is why the one RSB problem was solved at zero temperature by uh, Dings, Lai, and Sun, but nevertheless, we don't know how to solve it yet at positive and small temperature. We will see why. So this is a repeat of the what constraint satisfaction problem. Again, so what is a constraint satisfaction problem? It's a set of variables subject to constraints. The variables are our, ver our vertices in the graph, and the constraints are going to be the edges. 
we mentioned two problems uh, in the first lecture, coloring. Uh, each vertex color is a variable. Each edge imposes a constraint that it cannot be monochromatic. So this is an example, just written in small, that I have in the first uh, lecture of a proper coloring problem. We called it Q coloring because Q was the number of, uh, of colors. Here Q is probably uh, one, two, three, four, four, five. Yellow, um, green, uh, um, blue, and red. And you can see that this graph is properly colored. There is no edge. There is no edge that has both sides, uh, both sides colored. We mentioned another problem, independent set. Independent set, you try to put as many, ideally as many as, as possible vertices to be occupied by, while still not making any two vertices which are occupied connected with an edge. So this is an example of the mark of an independent set. You see that every place, every time a, a, an occupied vertex is connected to something, this something is unoccupied. But you see, you can put two of them to be unoccupied. That is fine. And this is a, a maximal independent set. This is a, a maximal independent. Maybe there is a better, but this is a, a maximal independent set in the sense that if you try to add any one of the if you try to occupy any one of the of the empty ones, you you will fail uh, the constraint. There will be an edge with two sides occupied. So in general, computer science problem, given a constraint satisfaction problem, try to decide if there exists any variable assignment that satisfies all the constraints. And the the interest is in finite graphs, but of very large size, growing. So it will be. Difficult. You can, of course, always try by just trying all possibilities, but this will take you an exponential number of steps. And all these problems are known to be hard in the sense that, uh, that the worst case will take exponential number of steps if P is not equal to NP, which is believable. So let's focus on, on a particular problem, which is a KSAT problem model, and what is this threshold conjecture? What is this uh, conjecture about alpha sat? What does this mean? Let's see what. So the case of problem is specified that we did it also in the last, uh, in the first lecture, but uh, this is done here in more detail. It is specified by a Boolean function, which each clause has with k. So k is a parameter of the problem. The problem has uh, will be will have two three parameters three really three parameters one will be the graph that we will be using or the family of graph the other one will be k and the and and we will uh, we will try to see when when for which graph and for which k there is a satisfiable assumption a, a, a satisfiable problem in which not so this is an example with k equal to four and it has three clauses here are the clauses x one plus x three Negation, minus here stands for negation. Think of your variables as ones and minus one. Uh, minus x, x5 or minus x7, that's clause number one. Clause number two is minus, uh, you know, was written here with minuses and pluses. And you try to satisfy all the, all the clauses. Right? So each clause is relatively easy to satisfy because it's enough to have any one of these equal to, to one. So if you just do them at random, and there will be one over two to the, one minus one over two to the four chance of satisfying a clause, but then you need to satisfy all of them, and there will be a lot of them. So that's, uh, that's uh, the problem here. So the variables here are x, x1 and up to xn, and we use the notation plus minus in this lecture. Plus one and minus one, that correspond to true and false. The constraint, each clause must evaluate to plus. Plus is true. So you want to make sure that, uh, for example, uh, you need to find a, a satisfiable a, a, a solution here. Can I do that? Da, 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 da. X6. Probably I yeah, can do it easily here, I think. You can just make, uh, make x6 equal to 1. That will take care of this one. Uh, make x4 equal to 1. That will take care of this one. And certainly you can deal with the first one. I mean, there are not that many constraints here to cause problem. But in general, you will do it on a large graph, and then I cannot do it just by looking. Large graph and a lot of vertices. So the SAT problem is to decide if satisfying assignment in plus minus n uh, exists. 
right? You, and this is a canonical uh, example of what of uh, of NP NP complete. We mentioned this in the first uh, lecture. Uh, this due to the work of the out of the beginning, so on to the seventies. So worst case uh, complexity presumed to be very difficult. Okay, so the both uh, both uh, uh, coloring and independent set uh, can be described as a graph, and the same will be also true about the SAT problem. It also has a graphical structure, although the graphical structure is a little bit more difficult, and it involves this factor graph that I, uh, I did for you uh, in the first lecture. So I'm just repeating what I did in the first lecture, but with more detail. So here is again the example of the, of the SAT problem, exactly the same problem as before, with three clauses of uh, four uh, variables. And we can uh, graphically represent it as a bipartite graph. We will put the variables on one side, and on the other side, we put what is called computational uh, nodes. The computational nodes are simply computing some constraint. So each constraint is written as one of these computational nodes, and the way we make the, the, the connections is we connect to each computational node. This is, for example, clause 7 we connect it to the variables that appear in this clause. So it's x3, x4, uh, x6, and x7. Those are the four variables that appear in clause 3. And we are going to use coloring of the edges to demonstrate which one come with a plus and which come, come negate, negated. The same uh, graphical representation I showed you in the first lecture for uh, easing spin models, where I use a, I use a dashed and, and uh, complete the lines to denote the the ones that have a J, which is plus one, and the one that has a J, which is minus one. So it's the same uh, representation. So if you want the, the ones, the blue ones are firm, so any blue one is good. Uh, once you have a blue one here, it will be fine. So if, if this one is one, or this one is one, that's good for you. Um, the same, so every, any one in any one of the, if you have an edge coming to this vertex that has a one, a plus one on the, on, on the end of it, then this clause is taken care of. So a single one is good enough here. In the, in the yellow one, a negative will appear, right? So you, if you have any minus in any one of those, then they take care of the relevant clause. So you have two ways to, to satisfy this. A random SAT is a, is a probability measure or over such graphs, right? So you choose, you choose randomly how you do this graph, right? You choose uh, the choice of the graph is represented here by what you put inside each clause. And the most commonly variant is what is called KSAT on a random, uh, on a random, uh, essentially Erdos-Rheny graph. Okay, so the KSAT at close density alpha correspond to the following. You have a set V of N variables and you have computational nodes, the number of computational nodes is M, is M, and M is supposed to be linear in N, so you make M to be proportional to M, so M is N alpha, but you want M to be Poisson N alpha, that's better, that corresponds to what happened on a erdos rheny graph. And E is a set of random edge, each clause has degree K, so each of these computational vertices has exactly K, in this, uh, particular picture, k is equal to 3. Uh, you can see it in here at the end. 3 and 3 and if the graph was done correctly, it's, it's 3 everywhere. They are randomly divided, the edges are randomly divided into a firm and negate, negative. It's exactly like in spin glass models. 50% of each one independently, you choose a color. You first draw the graph, then you choose a color. So you have complete symmetry. And all together, this form a, a case at instance, and you are studying now the average case version of case at, right? So K is specified, alpha is specified, the ratio between clauses and variables, and you ask yourself at large n, what is the probability that the graph that we just constructed at random has a satisfying assumption? That's a particular way, this, this graph represents a particular way to choose, to choose a random Boolean function. It's one particular way to choose a random Boolean function. Okay, 
case. So what is the threshold conjecture? The threshold conjecture is as follows. You fix k, starting with k greater, greater or equal to 2. 1 is not really interesting, because if you have a single one, you know what to do. And 2 is also not really interesting. The problem is start to be interesting starting at 3. And then the conjecture is that random k sat, the picture I gave you before, has a sharp satisfiability threshold. What does this mean? This picture describes to you the probability that the solution is satisfiable. Probability over what? Over the choice of these random graphs. Right? The choice of these graphs. And the claim is that the probability of satisfiable, it starts close to 1. Generally, it's, it's clear that this probability is monotone in alpha. Right? You add more clauses, it's not going to make your life easier because you need to satisfy all the old clauses and the new clauses. Everything was done independently. So the monotonicity is clear. Eventually, it will go to zero clear. It will start at one also clear. The sharp threshold conjecture is that this line gets closer and closer to a straight line when n becomes very large. Okay? So when n becomes very large, it should converge to a nice line like this with a particular position here, which is this alpha sat as a function of k. This alpha represents a ratio of close to variable. And this will be called, this is an unsatisfiable regime, and this is a satisfiable regime. And this, there was a, this, is a, this is a result of a simulation, actual simulation, of, a prob of doing this many times. Of course, for se relatively modest n, because the problem is difficult when n is large, uh, of a three-sat problem from a paper in 96. And this conjecture uh, was proved, uh, it's not difficult to prove it for k equal to 2 because there it's, uh, you can make it into an easy problem, essentially. But it, is, it was open until recently for all k greater or equal to 3. So that's, that's a question. And that's a question that uh, eventually uh, Ding, Sly, and Sun answered, at least for k large enough. They did not answer it for k equal to 3. They answered it for k greater or equal to k0. And their k0 is a formidable number, way larger than what is expected. It is not even clear whether the answer the conjecture is true all the way from 3, but it's true, it should be clearly true starting from some k0, which is far from the number they get, but their calculation is very long, so reducing the number is probably going to be difficult. Now, Eud Friedgut in 1999 did something which is called the Friedgut theorem, and the Friedgut theorem shows that a family of problems of Boolean functions of a certain type and k sat is included in this problem, these are random Boolean functions, has, a, has a, a threshold sequence alpha sat of n. That is, if you fix, if you fix, um, there will be a number, there will be a number alpha sat of n that may be moving with n, such that if you keep, as you choose n, you keep moving the number, you will get your threshold but the threshold will move around. So Edward Friedgut proved that certain family of, uh, of uh, Boolean functions, essentially monotone Boolean functions, uh, have the property that the probability of satisfying them is going to start at 1 and drop to 0 sharply when n, the size of the graph, grows, but the place where it drops may move with n. There is no guarantee that it stays fixed in any way. So there is some threshold, but you don't know what it is. Now, this leaves you now two possibilities. One possibility is that the threshold actually concentrates around the number. That's exactly the alpha sat. That's the k sat conjecture. And the second possibility is that there is a gap. You know, you have a, you have a, you have a threshold, but the thresholds are moving around. And if you look at the Friedgut threshold, the, the theorem of Friedgut is a little bit like ergodic theory. It tells you that there is a threshold, but it never tells you where it is. So maybe the limb for this is strictly smaller than the limb soup. You have this, you know, depending on n, you move around, but for every n you will settle at some point, but there is a gap between them. And um, it is known that this gap is supposed to shrink when k goes to infinity, but it still can be finite for any k. And People proved before this work of uh, Dink, Sly, and Sun uh, 
in I, early on proved some upper bounds and then proved some lower bound. Best one is from about the same time. Um, in principle, the way you get the upper bound is by doing certain moment calculation. And the way you get the lower bounds, there are two types. You can do algorithmic bounds, like we talked about in the context of, uh, of Max Cut. That is, you find a way to actually solve this problem for alpha sufficiently small. Or you can move to non-algorithmic uh, uh, approach. Now, in case that, algorithmic approach is far behind, is far behind, right? So it's, it's uh, up to here. It's not going anywhere. And it's not going anywhere, and it's not predicted to go anywhere because the problem is supposed to be difficult. So it's really not so easy to find whether there is satisfying, uh, uh, um, satisfying uh, uh, instance or, or assignment of the variables or not. And so the, the trick in 2002 and then in 2003 by Acleoptas and various authors was to move to calculating lower bound also by moments, by second moment, without committing to an algorithm. That improved a lot the, the lower bound, so they become very close to the upper bound, but there still was a gap. And the work of uh, Ding, Sly, and Sun proved that there exists a true satisfying uh, threshold. That is, a picture is not this picture, but actually this picture. And they characterize alpha sat explicitly. Characterized by essentially verifying a prediction that was done using statistical physics methods. The same methods that I mentioned mostly in lecture three. Okay, so now we go back to statistical physics of random SATs, random CSPs, with an emphasis on uh, zero temperature. We are not working with uh, positive temperature. So let's look at zero temperature problem. Each Boolean formula is a bipartite graph with color edges defines really a mapping, right? You assign, you take this plus minus variable, right? And you look at what this computation is doing. You get these numbers here. Then you need all of them to be one, then you are happy. Otherwise, the answer will be minus one. A satisfying assumption is simply the inverse of this map, complicated map, of plus, right? Function should be plus. And let's call this thing S, a set S. So in random, in random SAT, the graph G is random, and so S is a random subset of plus minus one to the S. And the question is, for N large, alpha fixed is typical realization of the graph give you a non-empty set S, right? If the set S is non-empty, you have a solution. If the set S is empty, you don't have a solution. I didn't write what S is, but you understand what it is. You need to do this calculation that all these nodes are calculating and check if each one of them came up to be plus. Now, probability, what we do, we want to look at the random uh, SAT model. And the, and the reason that, um, that, that it's difficult is because it is difficult to estimate the size of S, right? If you can estimate the size of S, you can clearly see if it's bigger than one or zero, right? That's even harder problem. Now, in general, how would you try to estimate the size of S? Well, if S is very concentrated, you will replace the size of S by the expected size of S. Expectation here goes over the graphs, and the expectation size of S is easy to do. That's, that's essentially the method that I mentioned in lecture, uh, in lecture three when I told you about general replica symmetric upper bound for regular graphs. I mentioned this for easing model. And I said, how do you do it? You simply could calculate the expected value of the partition function. S can be thought here as a partition function. Your weights over the different relations are either one or zero. And size of S is just the summing the number of possibilities. Now, and the reason that standard approaches fail is because the size of S is highly non-concentrated. So, so specifically, what is usually you do, most probably probabilistic do, they calculate the mean. And then they said, look, if the mean is very small, we already know that the probability of being greater or equal to one is zero. And we will believe the mean is a good estimate. If the mean is very large, then we will go about and work hard and prove that the second moment or something else is concentrated, so 
where the mean is, is where the answer is. Now here, it's not only hard, it's false. So in this case, the mean is extremely large relative to the typical value. Okay, so you can calculate the mean, it will give you an upper bound, which has nothing to do with what you want. So that's, that's already suggesting that there is a problem. Okay. Now, <coughs> the reason that, uh, the reason that uh, in random CSPs, the size of the solution space is not concentrated has something to do with the geometrical properties of this set, right? If, if you choose a set at random, then its size is extremely concentrated because you just, each one is just IID variables and you sum, you have low of large numbers, you're very happy. Here, this is not the case. So the point is that the statistical physics uh, give, give you some non-rigorous but characterization of the typical geometry of S. So they explain to you what happened uh, to the geometry of S, and there is a list of papers here from 2007-2008 by various statistical physicists. These are the papers that are the basis of the picture I showed you earlier in lecture one, and I will show you to you again in this lecture because it's really the basis of the work of Dean, uh, Sly, and Sun. So um, really the way statistical physicists approach this problem is by studying spin glasses. Spin glasses is what I mentioned to you in the context of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model in lecture two. Spin glasses are problems of disordered magnet. We started with this in lecture one. The magnets plus minus are, magnet is a plus minus configuration of spins with interaction, which is a, a, a measure on plus minus to the end. This is not a measure of ones and zero, but it's usually in positive temperature. It is disordered if the interactions conflict. Some of them are having positive and some of them having negative. We mentioned this in lecture two. And the uniform measure over the set of, of solutions of our KSAT problem or any other CSP is of the same kind. It's not physics problem, but it can be thought of as physics problem because you have constraints and the constraints conflict. These problems are harder the ones we talk about are harder than problems like the problem of easing which are in pots, which I mentioned in lecture two, in lecture four, because easing and pots, the constraints do not conflict. Everybody likes to be the same. Great. So you know how to solve the zero temperature. The problem for us was the positive temperature became difficult because they are not forced. There is a, there is a competition between entropy, number of possible solutions, and the energy of who is best solution. But the zero temperature for easing is trivial for ferromagnetic easing and ports. Zero temperature for this model is exactly what we don't know how to do, or don't know how to do generally, but we will know a little bit more after I mention to you. Now, the physicists say, look, it doesn't matter to me. I will just think about insight I get from study of spin glasses, for which I have this Parisi picture and all the stuff that was done about that, and I will just adapt it to the situation at hand. And this way, I will get all the information from here. Just adapt the scheme to this state and then just see what happens. Okay, so what are the conjecture? And this is again exactly the same picture I, I gave you before, just that uh, I used uh, green and, uh, and my slides were poorer. It's much better slides. Uh, okay, so what physicists conjecture is that for a broad class of sparse random CSPs, they will exhibit what is called one-step replica symmetry breaking, or one-step RSB, and that's a picture that I showed you. This is slightly more involved. The picture I showed you, these two were kind of uh, collapsed, but uh, this is a bit more. So you start with one solution, well-connected, distances between, this is, is graphical description of the set S, the set of satisfying assignment. You will believe that it's not a Euclidean ball, but it's the picture saying that, you know, starting at a satisfying assumption, the a satisfying assignment, there will be a way to modify not too many variables and move to another satisfying assi uh, assignment. This is just because there are lots of satisfying assumptions that are connected. Here they start to break out, but the majority stays connected. Some little pieces go out. It's like a little bit like a random graph that has a large uh, connected component and few small components. We don't care because if we take a, a typical point, we will land on this one. As we increase alpha, I, in the beginning I made this into one. As we increase alpha, we come to a point where suddenly the big blob shattered 
into exponentially many blobs, maybe of different size or maybe of the same size, we don't know, but exponentially many blobs, and the distances between them start to be linear. Now you need, in order to move from one cluster to another, you need to make a global change. You need to really forget about your solution or change half of it or some function. As you continue, the problem gets even harder, and you can no longer sustain exponentially many clusters. You now have one cluster essentially taking, let's say, half of the problem, and another cluster taking one-fourth, and so on, and there are maybe finitely many clusters, and you're done. And then, of course, at some point, you come to a point that interests you, and there is no more of a solution. If you try to understand the satisfying uh, assumption, you're working on this boundary, right? You're working here. So for you, interesting to know how it behaves around here, right? You don't really care what happens here. You may not even know what happens here. I mean, this is really easy, but you may not understand what happens here. It's not crucial. What is crucial to you is understand what happens around here. Okay, so in, uh, for such model, uh, a precise structure of the typical structure of the solution space for alpha in the regime preceding alpha sat is what comes from statistical physics. And you can use it and try to use it to construct a proof. Because you want to construct a proof of this. On the basis of this conjecture, one can derive an explicit prediction alpha sat equal alpha 1 RSB, the 1 RSB threshold form. And this was done by uh, Mezar Parisi Zekina in 2002 and by Martens Mezar Zekina in 2006. So this was already in existence, this prediction, more than a decade ago. Now the problem is to prove it. So that's what interests us here, to prove this prediction. Okay, so what do you do? How do you find bounds on alpha sat? As I mentioned, the bounds on alpha sat are done by the moment method. You just take the number of solutions, you calculate moments. Why do you like to calculate moments? Because when you calculate moments, you can put the, you can do the, put the randomness on the, on the graph in any way you want. And since lots of things are independent here, it's going to give you a nice formula. You can do the first moment, second moment directly. It's very easy calculation. But they are not good, as I mentioned, because they are not going to give you the right prediction. So what people did is they made increasingly sophisticated moment calculations where they do truncation or conditioning to deal with the fact that the typical value is not equal to the mean. So they said, oh, we will not calculate the mean, but we'll calculate the mean together with some indicator, and that will be closer to the typical value. And there are papers starting in 96, and there is a long history for upper bound and for lower bound. Now, the physics explains the source of the known concentration it strongly suggests that, the, that, but it also strongly suggests that moment method on the number of, of solutions cannot really detect alpha sat. I mean, other than how many you, you truncate it, it will not help you. The 1RSB hypothesis, however, indicates a better pass to the threshold because the 1RSB is telling you that if you go to the level of, of to the level of, uh, uh, the f First of all, the formula is not very short. I will do it. I will show you the formula in the last slide. It's not. It takes a slide. The formula. It doesn't take a line. Right. But but the point is, what one RSB tells you is that if you go to the level of the clusters, you get a replica symmetric solution. And the replica symmetric solution, we have an insight. This is what we did in lecture three. So if you understand what clusters mean then you are in good shape. Now, that's exactly where zero temperature comes very handy because in zero temperature, every realization is either good or bad. If you go to positive but small temperature, suddenly, what? Everything has a weight, and it's much harder to break into clusters. So the notion of what is a cluster or where do you find this replica symmetric object is suddenly much more vague. And that's why the success so far has been with one RSV has been always at zero temperature, not a small positive. Okay, so this is a summary of the results of uh, mostly Ding, Sly, and Sun, and most more recently, just this year, came another work of, uh, of uh, uh, Sly and Sun with uh, Yu Meng Zhang, and the principle they say the following: take a very large 
absolute constant K0. In each problem, they have another number. The numbers have nothing to do with the predicted number, right? So just make K very large, and then they prove that you have satisfiability threshold uh, for various problems, right? So the first problem, let's forget what the K not all equal sub is, although this is a problem which is the easiest to explain. Um, the second problem is the limit of independence ratio. In, the, in an independent set, I didn't say that, but in independent set, there is only one variable, the size of the graph. So what you do, you look for the, you look for the question whether the graph has an independent set whose size is a fraction of the number of vertices. And the game is what is a larger size, right? So the game is this maximal independent set. You calculate the maximal independent set in principle, and you try to check the ratio between it and the size of the graph. And, and the claim is that for these random graphs, it will converge to a sharp ratio. Now, the problems, are, the problems of, uh, of not on equal sat and the uh, random uh, in, um, the independent set, they were done on what is called K-regular graph, what you mentioned, k regular random deregular graph. Regular graphs do not have independence, but they have another property which is very nice, that when you look at the graph limits, which I mentioned in lecture one and lecture three, the graph limit is a regular tree. So anywhere you are, locally around you, it all looks the same. And this simplifies a lot of calculations. In the KSAT, this is no, no longer going to work in any case because you have all these random signs that you put there. So even if you take a regular graph, the case that problem becomes much more messier because of the random sign. And then you instead go to the Erdos-Reni version, which is the one I mentioned to you with the Poisson, where you gain a lot of independence. So, you know, the, 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 the regularity is lost anyway, so let's uh, take our next best friend, which is the independence. And... Um, in the last paper of uh, uh, Sun Sly and, and, and uh, Zhang, the, it's the first work where you can not, not only get information on the threshold between one and zero, between size of S greater or equal to one and zero, but you also get an estimate on the typical size of the cluster. And again, this worked back to the earlier paper, which is the easiest version. So these three versions, the most interesting to computer scientists is actually the KSAT, but the technical easiest is the K not all equal SAT with the, with the regular graph. So the, as far as the number of solutions is concerned, we are now back to the beginning, and I guess that in principle they should now try to go to the you know? And other people should also add to the game and maybe also try to deal with positive temperature and also what is even more important, try to find a proof that doesn't take 100 pages of calculation. Because the current proofs are very long and complicated. And again, in each case, they provide an explicit formula because it matches the one RSB prediction, which can be written. It's not, uh, as I said, it's written on a slide, not on a line, but it can be written. And as I mentioned, the main difficulty in the last version, in the case up, is a non-regular local profile fluctuations which worsen the non-concentration of the number. You know, the non-concentration in the size comes first from the one RSB. The one RSB tells you, as I mentioned to you, that if you do this beta messages approach, the prediction is that the messages are not, this, uh, are not deterministic. They are random. So different places, you will find locally a different measure. This is already a problem. But in the case of uh, KSAT, also the tree is random. So not only is the input of, from the boundary random, but also what you see between the boundary and you is random. And the reason that, and this has to do already because of the random sign. So even if you were making the graph regular, your life will not be better. So that's why they, they move to the, to the, okay. So as, a, as, a, as I mentioned, the, this paper really is like doing these two papers, but then observing that it's not regular, so you need to, whew, it's like, uh, it's the same principle, but, uh, but much more, much harder, and we, I will focus on explaining to you the RSB in the simpler regular setting, and I will propose that anybody who wants to read these things should probably want to read these two papers, or one of these two papers, and never read the other two papers. I mean, the point is that this, other two problems, both the independent set and, and case that are the problem of interest to computer scientists. The not all equal set 
is a kind of a, is a kind of artificial model. Now I can explain to you what is a not all equal SAT. The the SAT problem has a a, 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 a non symmetry because every plus if you have in the or in the or uh, any one uh, can do the job, but all the so all zeros is bad. If you do an or, a logical or, the configuration forgets the negation. If you write x or y or z, this will be equal to plus unless you see the configuration minus minus minus, right? In a not all equal, not all equal, of x, y, and z, you will get plus unless minus, 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 or plus, plus, plus. So we add here a symmetry. Right? It's a little, a little bit artificial from a computer science point of view, but it's now a symmetric problem, right? Changing all the pluses to minuses and changing all the sign, random signs you put, you come back to the same situation. And symmetry is good in life. It was good in easing, it's good here, the symmetry is good, and it makes the problem a much easier. So I mean, in the specifically with this symmetry, together with the choice of regular graphs, you are in much better shape. You can utilize the symmetry and get much sh shorter. The, the answer is not, the prediction is not a page, but becomes a line, which is already good. Okay, so let me try to explain to you the, run, the replica symmetry breaking principle. So again, the, the, the KSAT, one, one way to think of KSAT problem is, again, imagine that we are working below the satisfactory threshold, so there is a solution, and we will look at a uniform probability measure over this set of over the solution. It's exactly an easing, exactly a Gibbs measure with weights one on points in S and normalized by one over the size of S. So the normalization constant is exactly what we try to, to understand. So one way to, uh, to think about this problem is to think about sampling, right? Sampling a vector from this uniform measure. That's exactly what we talked about when we talked about easing, uh, about Gibbs measures in general. So this is going to be a plus minus value uh, process indexed by the variables. And asking about the geometric structure of S can be recast about asking what happened when we sample a vector from new when n is large. Well, it's the same, asking about the Gibbs measure. Okay, and this is exactly the factor model or Gibbs measure of Markov random field that I mentioned earlier when we did the, when in different lectures. Okay, so now let's see what is the difference between replica symmetric and replica symmetry breaking in this uh, situation. So replica symmetric, I remind you, meant that when we do the, the replica symmetry beta prediction, we used for the boundary of each point in the graph, for a neighborhood of each point, we used independent product for the boundary measure, which is to say we're saying that part, far away points are supposed to be uncorrelated. So we say that nu is replica symmetric, if far away variables are nearly independent. In particular, if you choose two samples from this replica, right, if you choose two long vectors from this solution, and you calculate the overlap, which is the inner product, then this will be well concentrated because it's a sum of plus and minus variables, right? And, and the variables from i and j, which are far away, are going to be nearly independent. So the law of large number will apply and you will get this number to concentrate. Otherwise, if nu has long range dependencies, it is going to be RSB. And in this case, you would expect, of course, you can have long range dependence, which magically makes this still a constant. But normally, if you have a long range dependence, this guy will no longer have a trivial distribution. It will have a non-trivial distribution. That's exactly the prediction and the core idea of Parisi is solving the spin glass model, the, the SK model. So you look at this overlap between two 
independent realizations from, if you want, this is really trying to check how correlated are two assignments of our con constraint satisfaction problem, right? We choose two assignments, uniformly at random, check the overlap. The overlap may not be one or zero, even in the replica symmetric case. It may be a number in between, but it's going to be in the replica symmetric, it's going to converge to a constant which is not random. And the clusters are kind of related to this non, to this distribution. Here, and here it comes. Okay, so conjecturally, KSAT and all these other problems exhibit both the RS and the RSB uh, situation in, um, in, um, in, in, in this regime, of course, it is well concentrated because the distances are going to be easily calculated. In, uh, in this regime here, um, what you have is, is you have exponentially many clusters and each of them will carry an exponentially small mass of the, of the solution. So if you take replicas, X1 and X2, these are called replica, has the name replica symmetry, replica, they two replicas. They are you're going to be in different clusters with very high probability because the number of clusters grow, the chance you will hit on the same cluster is very small, as opposed to here, where they will be with overwhelming probability from the same big cluster. Okay, so if they are in different clusters, um, they are going to be uh, dearly orthogonal if the clusters are far apart and the overlap will be with high probability near zero. And that's going to be clearly uh, the replica symmetric regime. What happened when you move closer to, remember we are interested in this place, we are not interested in this place or in other place. Now even what I wrote here, what is not really rigorously done, but this is a prediction. What happened near alpha s in this box, just before alpha s, almost all the mass is in bounded number of clusters, right? There are not a la large number of clusters. So replicas are either in different clusters with very small overlap or in the same cluster of large overlap, right? So both events occur with no negligible probability. So the overlap distribution is now non-trivial. It says at least two different values that can occur with probability does not go to zero. It's a non-degenerate random variable. This is a definition of an RSP regime. Now, statistical physics people, uh, predictions give much more. They give the mass distribution of these and they give prediction to this probability, they give prediction to everything, but the basic qualitative picture is what is described here. Okay, so let's try to understand why one would expect even the solution space to have clustering. You know, you can ask, where is this coming from? Why would you have clusters? The idea is this, the random SAT graph is sparse. Each variable participates only in bounded number of clauses because if it will become dense, the probability will just drop to zero and we will not have satisfying uh, solution. Each clause has some freedom. Right? It has, you know, there are two to, as I said, I mentioned two to the k different possible assignments. Most of them will work. Only few will not work. So a typical x in S um, has quite a few free variables. There are quite a few variables that participate maybe only in one clause or two clauses, and you are free to choose them and move them, and it's still going to be a solution. So by sparsity, you can extract a smaller number of free variables, we share no clause. And each one of them appear in a different clause. They have not been determined by the whole problem, and they also do not interact. Now, you can flip any subset of these to get another solution, but it doesn't matter, and these solutions are very close to each other. So you are getting a cluster of this size at least. Into the Now, for alpha large, where you are close to this place, there are not enough free variables to connect S. I mean, you can do this thing, but at some point you will, you will come to a place where, you know, this is like making a move of size one from a solution. You're trying to walk on the space of solutions without making large jumps. But there are only N delta, delta becoming very small number of free variables, 
So at some point, there are going to be separate, uh, separate class. So this behavior is typical of sparse constraint satisfaction problem. So it's not specific to any, uh, again, it's qualitative, it's not specific. What is specific is a quantity. Now, uh, the RSB causes non-concentration to the number of, of uh, let's see how it's connected to the previous mathematical challenge, the non-concentration of the number of, of cluster, uh, of the number of solutions. At the onset of, of one RSB, or RSB here, the onset of RSB, the expected number of solutions become dominated by the rare event of S having atypically large clusters. If you have a large cluster in S, then, you know, if you have, will give you a large, a, a huge contribution to the expected value, but its probability can be small. Just the, con the contribution to the, to the expected value can grow like two to the number of free variables. It's growing exponentially, and probabilities which go down to zero sub-exponentially are not going to be able to fight it uh, effectively. So in the typical picture, such large clusters do not occur, and therefore the expected value is going to be much larger, and there is going to be an interval of alpha where the expected value is much larger, even though typically the set is empty. So you're going to predict your, uh, your answer completely wrong, as I mentioned. So this effect was already noted in the, in the literature, and the key contribution from the physics heuristic is a precise characterization of the clusters. Right? Now you have this motion notion of the clusters, and you also know that if you successfully move to a model with clusters, you will... You will, get, uh, you will get as a result, you can apply then the, the replica symmetric solution. So if you can go to the clusters, you can employ methods similar to the methods that I mentioned to you in lecture three. You know for replica symmetric what, what should be done. Okay, so what is a one-step one, one RSB? So one-step RSB is a statement that once you go to the clusters, you are done with the, all the problems. That's the beauty of one RSB. That once you move one level up, you are going to be replica symmetric, even though the individual satisfying assumptions are RSB. Okay, so implicit in, uh, in, in this picture is that the clusters themselves can be encoded by a graphical model, which is rewriting new, right? So what you do, you define omega as a set of K sub solution clusters, which you can think of it as a set of connected components of S. Two solutions are connected if they are different in a single bit. And now, instead of, if you think of X drawn from new as a uniformly random solution, you can think of Y drawn from a different measure mu as a uniformly random cluster from this set omega. This is a one RSB. The assumption that mu has correlation decay that is amenable to, uh, to um, the assumption is that this, even though, even if the original new does not. This is exactly uh, the, the one RSB conjecture. The one RSB is based on moving to this level and then doing there what I mentioned to you in lecture three. Doing there this uh, uh, beta prediction with, bound, uh, with product measure. You just don't do it on the set of solution, but you do it on the connected components. And that's how you get to the formula. Okay, so what is a cluster? Again, a cluster is a connected component of S. It's a priori quite a complicated subset of plus minus one to the N. Why? Because the neighboring free variables can interact. So you don't know how they, they, they change, and you, you know, finding connected components on interacting model is a big challenge, right? Finding connected components on, this in, on percolation model, which is much easier than that, is all of percolation theory, or much of percolation theory. It's a difficult problem. However, near alpha sat, the clusters are relatively simple because near alpha sat, you are almost, you are almost running out of solutions. So there are not many free variables, and the free variables are going to form, they are either going to be isolated, things which do not matter, or they are connected to few other, like uh, small trees, and then they die out. So their effect is very local. So as a result, you can actually encode a cluster by a vector of plus, minus, and free. Free correspond to those variables which are free to change, such that if you choose, if uh, such that eta v is plus or minus, if and only if v is forced by the neighboring 
uh, uh, to, to the value plus or minus. So you can do a local calculation and get, you know, the problem with connected components is that in principle you need to walk and walk and walk to figure out if you are connected or not. Here, you make the decision whether you are free or not, or you predict the connected component locally, and it will work pretty well, even though it's not completely accurate. And, that, and the point here is actually that you should understand that the understanding of one RSB is extremely limited and difficult, but somehow understanding one RSB almost when it stops to work, almost when you have no solution, is easier, because there are not too much it's like, uh, it's like your trees start to become subcritical and everything die out, and so there is no way for things to evolve uh, too far. So the point is that uh, the cluster is encoded as a solution of a local equilibrium equation. The local equilibrium equation are simply, the f you're trying to calculate, e these are the equation very similar to the, to the beta prediction equation I wrote you. Um, and these equations are simply trying to say, look, I will decide on plus minus of three here and solve the, the replica symmetric equation for that to figure out whether the next one is going to be plus minus of three. And the problem is the problem we had with the with the sub assignments was that actually there was also this freedom. And that caused us to have this factor two to the n epsilon that multiply all the probabilities. But once we move to the to this eta business it's locally rigid. You cannot change eta of v without changing a neighbor. By definition, eta of v was plus minus o f according to its neighborhood. If you want to make any change in any one, you will need to go and change a neighbor. Then you go to the neighbor, you need to change another neighbor. So it's going to be pretty rigid, and you will not be able to find a lot of solutions which are nearby. And that is consistent with the one RSB. <coughs> Okay, so again, this is the kind of solution you have, again, for large K. And now, how do you find the satisfiability uh, prob thresholds? You solve them by you doing the moment method, just the moment method, not uh, something very sophisticated, but on clusters modeled in this higher level up of local equilibrium equations. So these are the beta prediction equations, but they are beta uh, belief propagation equations, but done at a higher level. This is like doing them on the level of messages that I mentioned. If you want to do the asymptotics for the number of clusters, like this, then it's getting harder because now you're not just interested in zero or one, now you need to tilt, you need to tilt the clusters according to their size because you're interested, it's like a moment generating function, you're interested in this variable, not in the question whether it is zero or one. And this requires more elaborate set of local equilibrium equations where, you know, more complicated. Okay, and as I mentioned to you in the third lecture, the theme is to, to reduce graph optimization to a tree optimization which can be recursively analyzed. This is the beta prediction calculation we did in lecture three and mentioned in lecture one. I just didn't write it explicitly. And the physics intuition is that in, an, in a replica symmetric model, each variable depends only on its local environment. And so the global geometry becomes irrelevant, and random regular models are in particularly nice. We mentioned this earlier on because they come to a regular tree, and this is a key simplification to the cluster model, which is now replica symmetric, and replica symmetric on a regular tree. So all these equations, as I mentioned to you in lecture three, you saw all the equations suddenly become simpler. There is no randomness, and you can just write all the equations become deterministic equations as opposed to becoming some equation in distribution. And in random sub, the variables are not trivially, are non-trivially influenced by neighborhood for any constant R. That's the problem of uh, this problem, which does not appear in the other one. And more importantly, the profile of our neighborhoods fluctuate randomly across samples and involve uh, correlation. So in addition to the correlation of RSB. So here, unlike the previous problems, you need now to work with this neighborhood, this is what I mentioned T before in the previous lecture, now it moves to R. And um, in the proof of, uh, of the last paper of being uh, Sly and Sun, involves now no longer moment calculation, but you need to do the moment calculation 
large R, send R to infinity as well, it's not enough to work with finite R, and you also need to do conditioning and truncation because of all these fluctuations. So you need to remove all the atypical neighborhoods, throw them away, look at the typical neighborhood, condition on it, break it into pieces, and it adds to, to complexity. In principle, you would like to do it much faster and simpler than this way. The physicists don't do it this way, but they don't prove. So they, don't, they are not bothered by such things. OK, so summary for this is that, you know, the, as I mentioned before, the worst case com uh, computational uh, intractability motivate interest in average case behavior. This is from lecture one. Physicists propose a universality class of sparse random CSPs exhibiting the same qualitative behavior, broadly termed RSB, and uh, many of them, the many interesting ones, have explicit uh, predictions. Those are the one RSB. In general, you can do also explicit prediction for two, three, four, and so on. Even infinity, like in the case of Max Card, but they will become bigger exponentially, bigger and bigger, take more and more slides and more complicated. And in the one RSB class, Ding, Sun, and Sly studied three classical problems and obtained exact asymptotics, confirmed the prediction for these three problems. They did not do the Q coloring because Q coloring is harder than all these three. So there is no surprise here, but they will. Hopefully them or some other people will do Q-coloring soon with the same approach. The method of proof, analysis of the clusters, gives some rigorous backing to the one RSB hypothesis that the clusters are, are replica symmetric, but much remains to be uh, un un understood because essentially everything I did not say is not known. I summarized to you the knowledge. Right? So I mean the knowledge is not big in the sense that there is no understanding what happened at positive t and low temperature. There is no understanding of what happens uh, far away from the satisfying, uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole picture and we just nail down one point. Once you go inside, this local thing disappears on you. So it becomes harder and you, the prediction still exists, but it's not uh, clear. Some of the other transitions are not done also, even the lower ones. Of course, the very, very low alpha is easy because you understand the loss there. Okay, and this is, uh, for example, uh, uh, the threshold from uh, Ding, Sly, and Sun. This is just to show you that, uh, <laughs> this is just to show you that uh, you don't want to mess with this. Right? So, you are defining, this is a, this is a, uh, this R alpha, alpha is your parameter. This mu is supposed to be the measure of your, messages, right? This is a measure on messages. These etas are going to be your messages. And then you have a distributional function with weights which correspond to, to the D. And what is the D? It's supposed to be, I think, D plus minus is supposed to be the number of plus and minus uh, forced variables you find in your neighborhood. And the eta is going to be the distribution of the free ones. And uh, uh, what? And then, and the phi I think is supposed to be, the phi I think is supposed to be the free energy, stand for the form of free energy, and you are interested in, uh, in uh, you know, when phi alpha gets to zero, right? Phi is a one over n log, supposed to be one over n log number of solutions that then goes to infinity. Positive phi means that you are still below. Zero is exactly the point where you drop in principle minus infinity. So this is going to be a replica symmetric solution, but you have these extra measures that replace what you had before as, uh, as, um, uh, as, as messages. And then, of course, uh, solution alpha is the unique solution of this problem in a certain interval. This interval comes from easy upper bounds. There are some easy bounds above and below which leave a gap but you know from the beginning that you are there, and part of the work they do is to check by computation that, for example, there is a unique solution to this problem. Right? That's one thing you need to know, otherwise you don't know where to put yourself. And of course, you need to justify the whole prediction. It's pretty impressive, and if you try to do it in a, at, at positive temperature, it will look even more impressive, and if you try to do it for two RSB, well, I will need to write over many, many goals.
just to write the solution. Okay, so let me now uh, tell you a little bit about what we will do in the next part of the lecture, which will have nothing to do with this. I mean, some of the same, but it's a different uh, story. Here we are going to look back at the easing model, remind you of the easing model. We are looking at the beta easing, um, we are looking at the easing model on a graph GN, which is a tree-like graph GN, whose limit is a 3 p and we are interested in in the Boltzmann measure on the easing, given that the, that the sum of the spins is positive. We call it mu n plus minus. And we will also define the beta Gibbs measure for easing on this tree with plus minus boundary conditions. And what we would expect, we would expect that for beta bigger than beta c, the Boltzmann distribution decomposes. If you look at the measure, the original easy measure on the graph of size n, if n becomes large, with probability one half you will look like a positive on the tree, and with probability minus one half you look like a negative on the tree. This is in the sense, this is not the measure on the whole collection, but it's a measure when you localize it to finite marginal. This is a, this is a simpler replica symmetric solution for easing, and we saw this elementarily in the case of complete graph, the Curie Weiss, in the beginning of the fourth lecture. And if you condition on one of these two, you will get the particular component, right? That's the same, this is a simple analog of this business with the cluster that I mentioned in the Sly and Sun. Very simple. Montanari, Mosel, and Sly proved this in the case of the regular one. And in my work with uh, Basak, uh, we extended it to a tree-like. There is another condition. This, con this is only working. This is, again, an, an example of statistical physics prediction. Might, you might believe that you don't need anything. It just depends on the tree. But that's not true. You need some edge expansion for GN in order to have this property. And I will explain this. So, so this is another example, like the example I gave you in, uh, in lecture three that I mentioned that some problems like uh, independent set or, or anti-ferromagnetic easing, when you can take things which converge to, a, to the same tree, but if they are bipartite, which is not a local property, then suddenly the prediction is different. Here is the same story. You can take even the easing model, which is nothing simple. If you look at such a problem, this identity of the cluster, this convergence, stop working unless the graph is well connected. Well connected in this property of expansion. So it's again an example where naive following of statistical physics will lead you to wrong conclusions. So I mean, the conclusion is really great. The prediction really great once you put extra conditions, which sometimes are needed. That's the moral of this story. And uh, we'll have now a five minutes break. And the last uh, 45 minutes I'll do on the board, trying to explain to you mostly the Montanari Mosel slide proof or regular and mentioning a little bit what difficulties are when you move to the general. We will now take a break. Okay. So what this part of the lecture will share with the previous part of the lecture is the fact that we are working on, uh, on uh, this is not what it is sharing. We are not work, going to work again on ferromagnetic easing on charge. As I mentioned before, uh, the constraint satisfaction problem are locally tree-like graphs. They are much more specific graphs. And we will have a GN, which is VN, EN. VN is going to be of size M. And we will put on it our favorite easing model, which is as I mentioned in lecture three, much easier than any other model of statistical physics you can think of, which is why it is best to start with that one. So 
configuration of plus and minus ones, and it is given by one over z n exponential beta sum j over edges plus b and always we will work with beta positive and most of the time but not always with b equal to zero actually here we will work with And in this case, I remind you our phase diagram. The phase diagram is the one we borrowed from the treatment of the, of the Curie Weiss. It's the same phase diagram. The complicated, there is some beta C. Something interesting and complicated happens here. And the line beta equals zero and B equal to BC. And if either beta is B is positive or B is negative, things are not so exciting. In this place, nu n should converge to nu plus, and in this case, nu n should converge to nu minus. And what we want to prove, the goal is to study local limits new n as n goes to infinity when gn converts locally to some random tree and beta bigger than beta c What we saw in lecture three, what I mentioned about the work that I did, the uh, first work I did with Andrea Montanari, is actually taking care of everything except the interesting part, which is here. Remember, in lecture three, we dealt with calculating for easing. We dealt with calculating how to calculate the limit of the uh, partition function, 1 over n log of dn, and we found that it converges to a fun formula phi, which we could write explicitly in terms of the tree. But a byproduct of this calculation is that we justify the beta, the beta prediction of the replica symmetric solution, and therefore uh, we actually can get this result. Okay, let me write this. This is going to be local weak convergence. And the claim is, this is the claim that we would like to prove, is that here mu n will converge to one half mu t plus plus one half mu t minus. This mu t plus mu t minus will correspond to, they appeared already in lecture three, they will correspond to the limiting easing Gibbs measures on our random limiting tree, where we take plus or minus boundary conditions and use the same parameters beta and b within the tree. So this area, which is not red, follows from my work with Andrea in really okay it follows from all any paper which proves which proves the convergence of the there were these papers that prove that one over n log Z n which we called phi n converge to phi beta and whenever this was done, the way it was done, a byproduct was the local weak convergence of the measure on the marginal, because it was done by justifying essentially the beta prediction. So 
and there was the first paper I wrote with them. First it was done for regular uh, by Franz and Leone, I think. And then with Andrea Montanari, we did it in for uh, more general trees, which converged to Galton Watsons. And then Domer et al. proved it to even more general. And then in this paper with um, Montanari and, and Son in, from 2014, we proved it for all possible limits and therefore stopped this, this industry from progressing because there was nothing more to do. And, but this also implies this. But if you remember, the way that this approach goes is we said, first, let's perturb the model by adding a small b. And we rely on the fact that this phi n and also the phi are going to be continuous in b. And we will solve it when b is non zero and declare that the answer at b equal to zero is the limit. So we never really study these models. Because this is exactly the place where things are starting to get more exciting because you don't have a local weak limit, which is a single point. Let me now uh, repeat for you the definition of what this convergence means. I'm just reminding you, B I of T is going to be the ball of radius T center of I, which is in N. IN is a uniform chosen, uh, uniformly chosen uh, point. N. And we have a definition. A definition. This is three light, right? GN. GN. Converge locally to a certain tree T, which is random, if O, o alternatively I can write GN locally weak converge to a measure mu, probability measure on trees. Right? So I can, it's like the same as, as the Convergence in distribution. You can either write it in the language of random variables, or you can write it in language of uh, probability measures. Actually, I should probably write this this way. Gn, which is an ensemble of graphs, converged to, uh, to this mu. If you have the limit as n goes to infinity, the probability that b i n t isomorphic to Tt is equal to 1 for every T fixed. This is a local, usual local reconvergence and delta, which is the degree of I n, is uniformly we call uniform sparseness, uniformly sparse, and this is called local convergence. This is due to Benjamin and Sean. The definition in a different context, and this we added in order to go the rest of the relations. And we have two, two examples, classical, canonical examples. One example is at uh, uh, is uh, K regular This is a very nice case because here the measure mu is becoming degenerate. Right? There is only one possible regular tree, which is the regular tree. You cannot have different trees. It produces exactly one. 
Um, and the other canonical example is that uh, Erdos-Reni Erdos graph converges to uh, Galt Watson, Watson Alpha. Okay, so the measure mu, we produce the trees according to the Galton Watson with uh, offspring distribution alpha. So this is what I, I mentioned these things, and I mentioned all of this on the, in lecture one, and repeated them in lecture three, and they are on your slides that are posted for lecture one and lecture three. Sorry? Ah, I said that this is, a, I can say that the sequence of graphs converge weakly to a tree and use a random variable, or I can think of an ensemble of graphs converging low weakly to a measure on tree. Yes, then uh, my question is, in that case, is random? You can take non-random. Yeah, you can take non-random, but a priori it's random. Yes. Well, in that case, in the second line, Yeah. This is also the P here. The P here will, okay. The P correspond to first the choice of I N always, right? Which is random already. So that's, this is really an average over the choice of I N of the indicator B I T is isomorphic. This is graph isomorphism because you don't care about the labels to a tree of a certain particular value of the tree to a, uh, of size T. If the graph is, is um, if the graph is random, you can decide whether the p will be also an average over the graphs or change it to an almost sure result over the graph, depending on your choice. So I avoided this specific statement. Uh, you write p super t equals to the ball of t super t is a tree of size t drawn from this measure mu. There can be randomness due to the choice of the graph, but even with a single graph, there is going to be possibly or usually a randomness due to the choice of the center. And this T is a random tree chosen from U. And actually, the statement will work. Sometimes we need to put expectation over the ensemble, but most of them will be for almost every sequence of graph that converge to a tree, and this P will only be over I. But if you want, you can take expectation. It's not, this is not, okay, this is a technical important uh, division, but uh, the, that's not the main, there are many other difficulties. This is usually not the issue because these ensembles are, are very well concentrated. Okay, so the question is, um, the question is, as I mentioned, is what happened to, uh, what happened to um, to the low uh, to the low to this regime here? And we already know, as I mentioned from lecture three, that one over n log of uh, of the of the z n convergence, which give us an, maybe a, a feeling that, um, that that things are, are are going in a certain way. And as I mentioned. Consequence, consequence of works on CN converted to phi beta um, is that when B is positive, mu n will convert locally to a plus. This is really new T e plus. I should, I don't know why. I didn't write the T here, but I should write the T T plus minus. And when P is negative, we have here to keep it 
symmetry it should be all symmetric. Remember that the key to the proof of this convergence was to show that you can, using FKG, you can bound above and below by free and plus in this case, or free and, and minus in this case, and you show that both of them went to the same limit when the distance from the place where you are went to infinity, and you, because of the local weak convergence applying for every t, you can first take n to infinity, and then take t to infinity. This is very similar to what I mentioned in the first part of the lecture about Ding, Sly, and Sun doing the second moment and then sending the neighborhood size to infinity, except here it's much easier because it's easy. Okay, so Montanari, Mosel, and Sly. 2012, actually, because the paper was written, as usual in mathematics paper, it was written in year X and then published in year Y, so it always depends if this is the year it was published, and the year it was written probably was the year of before. So this was published in PTRF, and they proved that, as in the Kugel Rice model, that uh, also. is equal to zero, but limited to one case where T is T gamma regular. They need the graphs to converge to a regular. They don't care if the graphs are regular, but they want the tree limit to be regular. And the star here is, uh, star here is what was on the slide, which I do not like. The star is what was on the slide. The star is mu n converged to mu Uh, sorry, converged to one half, right? It's not like that. I should probably keep to. Yeah. If I write any time k regular, you should just mom mentally change it to gamma regular. These notes were written with k, and the slides were written in gamma. After the case that I don't want to mix it up because there it's not the, it's not the graph. Okay, now the beta c in a k regular case it can be writ written easily. That's one of the nice things. You actually know where you are exactly. So this is theorem 2.4 of Montanari, Mosel, and Sly, which I will try to explain to you how it is uh, proved in the next. 20 minutes, it says that k minus 1 tangents hyperbolic beta, ah, k again, gamma minus 1, and it's suppose it's bigger than 1, that's, that's exactly the definition of beta c, if you did not, if you did not know what beta c is, it's written down for you. Then really part one, I think, mostly. Mu n converges locally in probability to one half mu plus plus one half mu minus. I can write mu half and mu minus of three, but you understand it's the easy measure with plus minus boundary condition on this tree, and this tree is non-random, so it's a one particular measure corresponding to taking plus or minus 
variable at level k, at level t from the root, and then sending t to infinity and looking at a finite neighborhood of the root. And part two is that uh, mu n class of x, which is really some constant times mu n of x the times an indicator some x i positive, right? This is a measure I mentioned earlier in the beginning, in the slide. This will converge locally in probability to mu plus. So this indicator is helping you make the choice. That's what we saw in the case of the Curie Weiss, so now we are repeating it in a harder case. And it's harder because it's not a complete graph, so we cannot really force things so easily. It's the same problem that happened in the Ding, Sly, and Sun with a sparse constraint satisfaction problem, except in easing it's much easier to solve it because there are lots of inequalities and tools we can use, and that's exactly the tool that Montanari, Moss, and Sly are using, and I will use this in my paper with Now, um, what does it mean to converge locally? Uh, this is the same as local weak convergence to a delta function on a tree cross mu plus. You can think of now the local weak convergence to be employed in the space of pairs, a tree, a graph, and on the graph, there is an easing measure. So you have a graph and a configuration drawn from the easing measure on the graph. And convergence locally to, to this easing measure corresponds to you choose your graph to be this one. There is no confusion what this graph is. And then you choose the measure that is configuration from this measure. That's what I mean by converge locally. It does not mean that the measure is the whole converge, but it means if you choose a point at random and look at the ball around it and see how the ball looks and how the easing measure on the ball looks in the graph, when n goes to infinity, the whole thing will converge to choosing the local neighborhood according to this tree and choosing the easing measure with a t plus want mu t gamma plus as a way to choose your distribution of the size. The local weak convergence theory applies in, for general spaces. What I did, I told you, is about graphs. But this is about gra decorated graphs. These are graphs with plus minus configuration on them. And you can find it in uh, uh, Aldous and Lyon survey paper. They abstractize the whole thing and do it on much bigger spaces. So there's no problem defining it here. Okay, now this requires an extra condition, as I mentioned already in my, uh, in my this. This is if, in addition, uh, Gn are uh, of lambda edge expander. Now I need to define to you what this means. So let me write here gamma lambda, a theta lambda edge expansion where theta equal to one half. So what is an edge expansion? An edge expander, this means the following fix a subset of n which has a good enough size. The size of the subset uh, is Yeah, and then this 
So edge expansion is really connecting for you, it's connecting the size of the boundary. So you have a set S and there is a set S complement. This counts the number of edges between S and S complement. Remember, S is a cut. This is exactly the width of the cut. It's a number of things going from one side to the other. You want it to grow at least by some proportion. This is fixed proportion. And you want to, when you send n to infinity, you want to see on the cut at least fraction of the number of vertices. Now, why do we limit to a number theta which is less than 1? Because obviously, if you make s to be everything, then here there will be nothing, and this will be not possible. So you cannot require a 1n. But here they require all the way up to half n cut, right? That's it. Now, this does not seem to be needed. That is, an open problem is to get rid of it. Open. The question is to relax this. But something is necessary in the sense that um, in the sense that, um, that the result is simply false without any condition. And I will show you very quickly in one minute why you need some condition, because I will construct you a counterexample if you take graphs that converge to a tree without putting any restriction on, the, on the how well connected they are. A counterexample coming again from this paper of Montanari, Moss, and Sly is take a graph, Gn, that looks like this. There's some pieces. One, two. Now, each piece is going to be identical, right? Identical. Identical. Gn over R two graphs, each converge to a regular tree. And there is no edges between them. Okay? So if I condition on the sum over I equal one to N X I positive, I can write it also obviously is the sum over the xi in each one of them summed up over the r, right? So I can think of it as the sum yi, we call it yj, r positive, where yj is the sum of xi i in bj. Okay, now obviously, if you condition on these are very large graphs, right? So this is almost like normal, the sign, right? So the signs are random variables, and condition, so condition on the sum on this, star, the probability each component. is uh, probability Q, which you can write as one half plus order of one over R. We make R depending on N uh, to have YJ positive. So what will happen if you look at mu n plus, at mu n plus, right? If you look at this measure that I mentioned in the segment. Okay, so you choose your center. It will be in one of these places. And then you will either go to the plus if the y was positive, or you will go to the minus if the y will be negative. So this will go to q. Um, Q delta nu plus plus 1 minus Q delta nu minus. And this is not the same as nu plus or minus, because in this regime, nu plus is not the same as nu minus. 
So obviously you need something. This is a demonstration that some connectivity is needed, but this could, and you can also connect a little bit, right? I mean, this example is very easy because I was completely independent. I can put a few edges here and still work harder than get it. But it is clear that this is taking the com complete extreme point of view of asking for a huge amount of connectivity. The truth is somewhere between that and not assuming anything. And it's interesting to understand what it is because this is an extra condition that is not reflected in the tree limit. You can ask here really is how much connectivity does one need in order to stay with a kind of like the complete graph store. We need some, but probably not too much. So if anybody wants to try, you, you, can, uh, you can try it. Okay, so let me now uh, put a little bit more, uh, put a little bit more notations. And uh, the race is uh, disappearing in MMS very clearly, although slightly short of the way I wrote it. <coughs> Probably immediately, immediately after the theory. Um, so let me put uh, one more uh, notation. Let me define P and T of I to be the joint law of the ball and the configuration on the ball. Well, X is, mu. X is the marginal of mu on the ball together with the ball. And this is a, on, this is a probability measure on G bar. The bar star here will be connected, connected graphs, it's plus minus one uh, marks. So that's the object we are looking at. We are looking at choosing a, a, a ball and choosing a configuration. And we will say that mu n converge locally weak convergence to a measure n, which is a probability measure on g bar star, if the law of p f is p n t of i n. We fix a P, we fix an N, we choose I uniformly at random, converge weakly as probability measure in this space to M to the T, which is a projection of M to TT for every T. So that's exactly the analog of our local weak convergence, but from space of graphs to space of probabilities on graph to probability on mark graph, which allows us to keep the easy image. So the MMS strategy, the proof is to do it in two steps. Step number one is prove a weaker Convergence of the average. Meaning you take the expectation over IN of P and T IN, and you show that this convergence with the new T. In sum, mu, which is a probability measure. So you first you move to a weaker notion of convergence, and you don't necessarily even identify the limit. The point is like the usual method of 
proofs in probably in mathematics often done by first tightness argument, something like that, give you a limit, and then you go study the limit. So for the tightness argument, it's more convenient to work with a weaker notion of convergence. And this is this is um, and this in and this step in, in one soft uh, compactness. Compactness gives uh, subsequential limit points. New bar. And also, it tells you, again, by soft arguments, that these are shown to, there must be uh, Gibbs measures. These are shown this is slightly non-trivial. This is trivial in the general, in the regular case, slightly non-trivial when you work with new n plus due to the condition. If you don't condition, it's just a theory of Gibbs measure. Limits of Gibbs measures are Gibbs measures, more or less. And the set of all Gibbs measures is pretty compact if you work with nice enough topology. And this topology was deliberately chosen to be nice enough. That's why you work with it. Fun, fixed. Here the trees, the graph or the tree or whoever has a, you have control on the degrees. So the number of possible objects you may find here is finite. So it's really a very easy kind of compactness argument. In the condition, in case there is slight problem, but the problem is not too bad because the event on which we condition, we can show, slightly use some work, does not go to zero. If you condition an event of positive probability, which do not diminish, usually they cannot ruin any compactness argument that you had before the condition. Now, of course, this leaves us with a hard problem, and the hard problem and the key is step two, uh, sorry, there is also step two, which is not too bad. Step two, you get local reconvergence by using, uh, by utilizing uh, Extremality plus, but in between uh, step one and step two sits a question why new bar is equal to new plus. So in between sits a key step which is identify new new bar is either one half new plus plus one half new minus or new plus new once you identify the limit point as one first of all you know what it is secondly you know you have a limit now the new plus is an extremal measure it's kind of the largest in some sense and therefore you can use it in order to argue that also your convergence was on average, there is no way to get a mixture anymore. Right? This was an, there is an average here over the centering point. So in principle, you might end up with something which is not what you expect when you remove the, the average, because maybe this is an average of the originals. But if what you got is extremal, there is no way for this to happen. So the whole uh, key to the proof is to, to prove that the limit is what you want the limit to be. Everything else is uh, kind of soft in general. Let me explain to you where the tools are, what is a key tool here, and that will be at the end of, of the lecture. So this key step. Is to show A when 
a is really the key, mu bar is 1 minus q mu plus plus q mu minus or sum q. Right? So you reduce the set of all possible Gibbs measure, which is infinite, into a linear collection, a straight line with one free parameter. In part b, q equal to half or q equal to zero. This is in the new n plus, and this is in the new And the key is really to do part A. That's really the important part, point. Well, you can verify. If you already know that this is a limit, you can look at some statistics and figure out the value of Q. For example, just look at the average magnetization. You know that under the easing measure, it is going to be zero. And this is not zero. This is not zero. But the negative of it, the only way to match them is by changing Q equal to half. In the plus, you know, it's, it's, you need to know something a bit more. The key part is part A. So what is the proof? Uh, actually, maybe the key part is part B. Okay, part B1 is easy, part B2 is not. Okay, let me call this in 1. And this in Difficulty to do B2 and A. Uh, how do you prove A? Well, you look at the limit, expected value mu n plus xi xj, this is a random edge. So what you do, you choose an i, which is i n, random, uniformly, then you choose a j, j n, which is a random neighbor of i n. So you just choose a random edge. And if you choose a random edge, you can get the fact that this is mu, mu plus of x0, x1. This is an edge, an edge of the root dt gamma, which is also equal to mu minus x0, x1. The reason you like to look at this uh, product is because the product eliminates the sign. In principle, the plus and minus are sign change of each other, but if you multiply two variables, all sign changes disappear. And this was done already in my paper with Andrea, or in any other paper which deal with the convergence of phi n to phi beta. It was done by calculus, if you remember, this from lecture three, this convergence was done by calculating derivative. As I said, you can either differentiate in B or you can differentiate in beta. When you differentiate in B, you get the magnetization, which is not helpful here, but when you in beta, you get exactly the correlation. So in particular, you, this part of the proof was really to prove this. That was a derivative. And then you integrate it. So you know this already. And, um, and why are you done? Because now you check that for every measure new, any possible measure new on uh, on graphs on on any measure new of plus minus one where the graph is a regular tree, the new bar of x zero a x root x one is less equal to the value you just got. So this value not only is the limit, but it's also maximal the maximal possible value. And further, which is even more important, it is strictly less unless, unless a new bar is equal to whatever it is, what I wrote there. So I will call it, this is lemma one of MMS. I'm actually giving you the lemmas in the paper. And this is lemma. But lemma one is very easy. It's coming from, as I mentioned, it's coming from this. So lemma one, I put a, a sorry. The 
convergence is easy. Lemma one is this inequality, and lemma two is a strict inequality, which actually is a trickier part. Now, part B, the proof of B, as I mentioned in case one, by symmetry, and in case two, you need to use the expansion. take a look back at what I said as the outline of the proof, and you remember the counterexample that required expansion. Everything that I said worked for the counterexample except the last part, that you actually equal to zero. Without connectivity, the Q doesn't need to be zero, even if you condition magnetization, because the different pieces can have their own magnetization. So that's exactly in, 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 in part B, is exactly where you use uh, uh, the the expansion condition, and this is lemma three of MMS. So MMS really have three lemmas, and the rest of it is very soft argument. One is that it's inequality, two, the strict inequality, and three, that under edge condition expansion, in the conditional case, you get Q equal to zero. And uh, and what? Let me say in word what one one more word why uh, how this is done. Um, okay, so the point is that both in lemma two, lemma two in MMS is really a simple calculation because if you work on a regular graph then you know what is new plus and new minus. You have an explicit formula for this measure. You have explicit formula for what the boundary conditions are, which I mentioned. The BP equations are equations in finite dimension. So you can use it and just work out what this can be and what this can be, and this is just a maximum. You just work it out. If you go to a general graph, you need a more sophisticated approach to this problem, and that really was a major difficulty in this paper with an Nirban Basak, that we no longer can rely on the explicit calculation, so it was a lot of trouble to get this strict inequality, but we got it with a different argument, not computational. As for the lemma three, the idea is somehow to use, use the expansion condition in order to get a proof by contradiction, and for this you needed to, to cleverly, lemma three, the idea was to cleverly, cleverly introduce a statistics that forces Q equal to zero when expanding. And what was the statistics was, you know, you want, what you want to do, you want to put some measure of confidence, you know, you, in principle you want to say, uh, you already know that uh, the magnetization is positive, but what you don't know, whether it is possible for vertices to be plus and have neighbors which are minus and their neighbors which are plus and so on. You want to somehow find that there are big islands of minus and big islands of plus, Maybe, and then show that the island of plus cannot be too large because it will have a lot of edges between it and the island of minus, and that will, con co that will contradict this extremality of the, of, the, of the fact that you get the magnetization correctly. So they build the statistics which amounts to looking at the ball around you and checking that in the ball there are many more minuses than pluses, or many more pluses than minuses, in order to decide on a probably value whether you are plus, minus, or we don't know what you are. And they used it to con construct a proof by contradiction, and in the paper with Anir Ban Basak, that required even more modifications because the graph was not, was now no, not, the tree was not regular, so you need to get rid of all the trees. Since the tree is not regular, locally <coughs> it might look to you, in your neighborhood you might actually be at high temperature even though generally you are at low temperature because you got a very small tree around you. 
and that causes a lot of trouble because this is noise, this will kill you. So you need to put an indicator over those neighborhoods, kill them, and so on and so on. It's very similar to what was done later by, uh, by Ding, Sun, and Sly, but much more difficult in their case of the constraint satisfaction problem. And that's again where the edge expansion is needed. You really need to work better on what, when are you plus or when are you minus. It's again, the problem is the fact that you are sparse. The same story I mentioned in the first part. Okay, so I'm already over the time. So let me thank you for listening to this long uh, an hour course. And I hope you, you got uh, much out of it. And I will uh, revise my slides uh, for, uh, for the, um, of the first part a little bit, uh, removing uh, much of the text there, and then add, because I have some slides also for the second part, but not complete slides. I will add some slides for the second part and remove some slides from the first part, so it will be the same. <laughs> I mean, the same length, but different. This will take a few more days. Okay. I don't know of any result which does not, okay, well, there are only two papers on this and both of them require essentially this condition. Um, you would expect, for example, that it suffices to have a delta lambda expander. I mean, first of all, you don't really need the expander condition on small sets probably. We don't know how to prove anything without it, but you probably need only sets which are, uh, no, maybe this we already did. We already got rid of small sets. In the proof, you need only sets which are large anyway, because you kind of break to sets which are linear in N. So you can change it to sets which are not of size half, but start at size epsilon N and end at size one half N. But it's not. And you would ex need some connectivity, but not clear why you need linear connectivity. The proof somehow suggests it, but you would need some connectivity, sizable. How much? You can come up with this counterexample. I mean, the problem is you want to make sure that making the magnet global magnetization positive forces the magnetization around you to be still positive. We can come up with some condition that seems to be reasonable and which will be far from the condition we required, but the proof will collapse. The proof somehow needs this because the proof doesn't take any uh, prisoners. The problem is the proof you somehow go on a random set. The set will be the set of things which are predicted to be one by this clever statistic, which is a random set depending on your measure mu a, and you look at it and it's complex. You have no idea what this set is, so you just make a global condition that, okay, I don't care what this set is, I have something. You utilize this something to get a counter example. That's why this um, uniform condition is, because you really don't know the, what the set really is. So I don't even know. There isn't even a conjecture beyond the conjecture that this is too, too much. Another thing which is not known is what happened for POTS models. Even POTS on regular graph, if you remember from lecture three, for POTS on regular graph, there was this area of non-uniqueness for which we couldn't really work using this. So we don't even have this part, not to mention all these other things. So even POTS on regular graph, we found the limit, we found this, by, but did it while avoiding doing this, cal this calculation, or essentially not being able to do this calculation. There was an area where 
outside this area, it's the same result as I mentioned here. So there is this little triangle where there is no uniqueness. Outside, this is working. You will go to the limit because there is a unique limit. But inside, we don't even have this. I mean, so you can get, obviously, the first part, the, the weak part. You know that the measures are extremal, so you know the beginning, you know the end, but in the middle, the whole proof disappears on you because you don't even know how to prove this. And of course, all the, other, all the other harder models, we don't know what to do. Infinite many open problems. In this case, uh, let's start from again for all the different, so preparing the little lectures.